Um, welcome to On the Radio, 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 like the Donna Summer song. Um, local Chicago radio stations in the rise of house music. So we're starting with two panel discussions. Um, the first one is more centered on radio stations that cater to youth and to college students. And then the second one is more focused um, on popular uh, radio, radio for adults, radio typically connected to R&B and soul music. So part of this discussion, or most of this discussion, is to talk about the central role that radio stations have played in the expansion of house music um, as a musical genre, but also as a culture. Um, here in Chicago, radio has been critical in not only just playing the music, but preserving the music for decades, such that we can still hear tracks 30, 40 years old today. Um, so radio has been a critical archive of house music. So today we have some established radio personality slash DJs with us today. We are so grateful and honored to see you, to meet you for the first time. Um, I'm going to introduce our first discussant and then he will introduce everyone else. Thank you for being here. So, so great to have you here. Uh, Mario Smith, uh, also known as the mayor of Park, High Park, <laughs> who needs minimal introduction. Uh, Mario is a Chicago poet, educator, producer, and radio chat show host. Mario is the host of News from the Service Entrance. Um, on WLPN LP, that's Lumpin' Radio, if you're not familiar with them, who are literally right up the street from us right now in Chicago, the Randomly Selected Podcast, and the Who You Got Podcast with Mark, Mike, and Mario. His poetry appears in the books Power Lines, A Decade of Poetry from Chicago's Guild Complex, and The Breakbeat Poets, published by Haymarket Press. Welcome, Mario. Thank you for being here today. All right. Thank, oh, there, that's me, Mario, moderator. Yep, that's my face. That's all of it. Um, thank you all for being here. <clears throat> um, there, this is an opportunity for us to have a, a, a conversation about why what is referred to on some fronts as secondary radio or, Chicago, or college radio is important and how it really propels and fuels what goes on in the mainstream because generally the music that you hear on a WHPK or NUR or a KKC is music that people actually listen to. <laughs> and the stuff that you tend to hear on more of the mainstream radio stations are stuff that people are suggested that they listen to. So this would be a chance for us to have a conversation around those things. I'd like to introduce our panelists uh, from your left, Jamal J2 Jeffries. He is a DJ, of course, musician. Uh, artist based here in Chicago. He has been doing this for 30 years plus. He is a DJ for one of my favorite rap groups of all time, The Prime Meridian. He is a creator and founding member of the PCP All-Stars, one half of the big fellas with my other friend, Sean Dervis, who is also quite a basketball player and a great bass player. Like one of the best bass players in the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, he is a resident DJ and creator for Heavyweight Soul, Vinyl Envy, Mood, Music, and Vibes Deluxe. And he is the co founder and co producer of Vinyl and Vittles. He is a full time live wire, that's no joke, and picture drawer, saving the world from mediocrity since 1972. Ladies and gentlemen, J2. <laughs> Lauren Lowry is a cultural archivist and historian trained in archives management, including collection, I'm sorry, collection development, digitization, repository management, and exhibit curation. She is the executive producer of the Vintage House Show on WNUR.org, 89.3 FM, VintageHouseShow.tv, and the Vintage House Show podcast, VintageHouseShow.com. Ms. Lowry has presented at the Society of American Archivists annual meeting curated the City of Chicago's House Music Symposium and exhibited at Chicago State University. She has professional certificates from the National Archives and Records Administration and Modern Archives Management and Northwestern University in Museum Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Lowry. 
and Dr. Regina Spellers Sims, the prejudice president. <laughs> I'll learn how to talk. One of these days it's gonna happen. The president and CEO of Eagles Soar Consulting LLC DBA. She sells solar. Dr. Regina Speller Sims earned a PhD in intercultural and organizational communication from Arizona State University. She also has an MBA from University of Bridgeport. Her company, Eagle Soar Consulting LLC, provides training, grant writing, curriculum development, strategic planning, mentoring, and research services relating to business, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Her other company, She Sells Solar, provides sales. I'm sorry, Mari, are you okay? She <laughs> provides sales, various universities. Dr. Sims has created and taught courses on the undergraduate and graduate level. Dr. Sims is an award-winning author of book, chapters, journal, and magazine articles, and digital study guides. The second edition of her co-edited volume, Black Berries and Red Bones, Critical Articulations of Black Hair Body Politics, is currently in work. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Regina Speller Sims. Okay, so part of this is also about Herb Kent. I have to get myself together before I talk about her because even in the afterlife, he might sneak up and hit me in the back of my head, which he did many, many times. And first lady is sitting to my left. Um, I do want to tell a quick Herb story and then we will get into it. This will be brief. So many years ago, I had Herb on my show when I was on WHPK. Uh, this was like in the seventh or eighth year of the show. My show is 22 years old now. And Herb came on the show, the book was coming out. We have a whole conversation about the book and he's, you know, doing his Herb Kent thing. Yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. I'm talking his smooth Herb Kent talk. And he goes, he goes, so, you know, I gotta get you guys on the battle, me and Gary Tyson. And I'm like, yeah, man, we would love to be on the battle of the best because the battle of the best, if you don't know, and I don't know how you couldn't, on a Sunday afternoon, that was appointment radio, everybody in Chicago, regardless of your gender or color, listen to the Battle of the Best. So a couple of weeks pass, we get the invitation from Rocky, his producer, rest in peace, and we go down <laughs> to V103. Gary and I are sitting in V103. The heat comes on, it's summertime. The heat comes on at V103 in the little area we were waiting in. And me and Gary trying to be cool, you know, I'm like, man, I'm about to be on the battle of the bet. This, in my mind, one of the biggest things I'll ever do in my life. It's Herb Kent. He is everything to me on many levels, and it's the battle. I know all my friends listen to the battle. It's about 85 degrees in this tiny lobby we're in. We dying. Me and Gary are literally sweating. And I'm like, yo, man, you think Herb turned the heat on on us? And Gary's like, oh, he definitely did. Kept the heat on, we waited an hour. I'm telling you, the man was crucial. We get in, or rather he comes out. He's like, hey, how you guys doing? And we're like, hot, what the hell you mean how we doing? Herb, turn the heat off. He goes, oh, you'll be fine. Comes in, to quicken this up, cheats through the whole battle of the best. He won, but he cheated. And before he passed away, I told him, you know I owe you one for cheating. You'll never get me. And I never got a chance to get him. But Herb was an amazing man. And a lot of what we are being able to do with college radio and, and secondary radio um, is anchored from when he did the Punk Out show many years ago. As I was telling uh, Joe, I was in eighth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade when that show used to come on. And this was after Herb had lost his gig. And all that's detailed in the Cool Jet book. And he was playing the waitresses and Susie and the Banshees and the Talking Heads and just all this punk music. It was Herb Kent playing punk music. And it changed the way, in my mind, how DJs, particularly DJs and radio announcers of color, would approach music as they announced it. We're talking about how the college radio uh programming situation has changed how people listen to music and it's more about music that people like as opposed to music that people want to hear and I will start with the ladies first so Lauren in your experience with your show the house music vintage show how how do you go about the programming aspect of the show and and what are some of the things that 
when you think about Chicago radio, that 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 Chicago radio could do better in terms of programming music. So the interesting thing about sort of WNUR is that it's supposed to be about experimental music. It's not supposed to be about current music forms. Uh, so I was a DJ there when I was in school from 1986 until 1989. And during that time, you know, house music was new. You know, the Street Beat Show uh, was a new format. Uh, it started off very small. So I've done all the research around how the Street Beat Show came about because I did an exhibit about house music and if I'm going to do that, I had to figure out sort of house music at Northwestern. Where did it begin? Because it's, it was known for its jazz show. It was known for its rock show. And we saw the slow progression of sort of black music forms outside of jazz at WNUR. So it started out probably 1980, no, 1977 as like a, as a, uh, sort of a black news report is called Third World Report. So anything called Third World Report is going to get some eyes on it. It then moved to, um, you know, sort of instead of just news, it moved to music. And at that time, Gil Scott Heron was very popular, things like that. So it was started to become sort of um, protest music. And it became, you know, even more, so even more eyes were on that. And then, it slowly became about more music. And in 1983, they, be, they created what was called Street Beat. It w went from one thing to another thing to the soul show. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, some Europeans decided that it was going to be then called the Street Beat Show. And I sent the document uh, to the Chicago Black Social Culture Map that outlines exactly what they said. We have taken it upon ourselves to move the soul show and rename it the Street Beat Show, which was good. It, it ended up highlighting house and hip hop, so it was a house and hip hop show. So when I arrived in 1985, they were playing mainly house and hip hop. When Brandy got there, when Regina got there, it was, I mean, you could play whatever kind of house and hip hop you wanted, but there was a progression of the music and it was supposed to be about current music forms, things that were happening. So, um, you know, WNUR can and will, if pushed, you know, align itself with what's happening new in, um, you know, in music. I came back 10 years ago almost and said, I wanna create a show. That's when we were starting the Dance Music Foundation. And we had an event where we were highlighting Chrissy and all of the beautiful women in house music. And I said, you know what, how come we can't, we should, you know, pr we should promote this show, uh, this event on WNUR. And I'm, I'm a grad, so I said, let's go in and do it. And they were very open to doing it and then gave me a show. So they tend to be more proactive, but it's a college radio station, you know? And I said, again, they're, they're young people sort of running that show generally. So you can be more proactive. It's certainly not, you know, private radio. It is not a money-making venture there. So probably a little less, you know, of a problem asking for a new show and getting it. And maybe later I can tell you sort of the issues with creating the black shows because you could literally be kicked out of Northwestern University by something you said on that show, not just erased from the station, but Europeans would make sure that they would impact your ability to stay a student there based on that show. So there was issue after issue after issue if you look at history. Speaking of issue after issue, I will now talk to my man Jay too briefly about the place that I was along with, with you at WHPK. And I will frame it by saying on my lumping show, I thought I was gonna lose my job because I went berserk about how WHPK is being played by the University of Chicago. The University of Chicago has a $10.5 billion endowment. WHPK needs $57,000 to execute their budget and they will not give them $57,000. That being said, were it not for WHPK, and I know this is a house-centered discussion, but if it weren't for WHPK, not solely, but in, in a large way, hip hop on the radio in Chicago, it would, it, would have, it would have been more of a challenge, I think. What J.P. Chill did by playing all those records when there were no Dusties, there were no oldies in hip hop, it was all new. Every song was new. And the fact that he was able, along with the other people who ran that show, were able to break those songs on HBK, it's a, it's a testament to what you were saying about being able to just, this is what we're doing. We're going to do it. 
You're going to like it. It'll be fine. Moved some years later when I was there with, with you, um, station changed a bit. Not the station in as much as the university changed their attitude toward the station. WHBK has always been that place, right? You could hear the wildest of the wild in the middle of the night on HBK. And you also had a chance every now and then somebody big might drop in and, you know, bless the mic for you. One of the most famous battles of all time, Common and Kanye, like a real, I don't like you, I don't like you either battle happened at WHBK. Um, in your experience, Jay, since you've been there, why do you think they've made it so difficult, particularly WHBK, for voices like yours to be able to, to keep that pace and be able to fly free and not be so tied down? Wow. Uh, um, <clears throat> I would think that uh, I don't know, there's probably uh, 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 some kind of underlying feeling of it It might not be necessary um, and definitely not necessary to keep it running the way that it was running because it was definitely more, there was more uh, interaction with, with the neighborhood. There was a lot more local, local hosts, um, Arkansas Red, who uh, to me is, you know, that's like a, uh, that's, I don't want to call him the poor man's herb kit, but I feel like he was just as important to me growing up because his show was always like on before maybe the hip hop show. So I would hear his voice and then when I actually met him, he said, you know, he sounds like a hundred year old man but he looks like a you know like a forty five year old dude. The voice definitely does not match the guy. But um, I just think that you know before there was probably nobody was really paying attention. I just keep keep it honest. It probably ran itself. It, I just I just got to be truthful. That's, it, that's it, fact. Yeah, I just feel like somebody started paying attention, and then you know things. You know, people started kind of trying to figure out how to allocate what and what, you know, what resources need to go where. And so in doing that, I think wound up alienating a lot of the uh, the hosts. And so I know I, I had no problem not doing shows there anymore. Just because it, it would just, things would get, get to be ridiculous. Hey, man. Just ridiculous. You, you know, the, the equipment being missing and just throwing all kind of, you know, silly stuff. They were paying the engineer, Lynn, what they would pay professors to fix that junk that never worked. Yeah, I don't even know who that is. Man, I, saw, <laughs> I, saw, I saw that wonderful man way more than I needed to because generally at two in the afternoon on my show, right. that's when everything would break down from whatever happened the night before. I'm like, it happens every Thursday on my show, everything breaks. And then Land would be in there, it's like, oh, I got you this week, and he'll fix it, and then we'll be up and running. But yeah, they, they created an atmosphere that they didn't need to create because they finally started listening to what people were doing. And if they would really listened to what we were doing, they would have been like, you know, this is brilliant because these are black voices on this predominantly white university's radio station that we absolutely have no idea what they're doing, but it sounds fine. And it doesn't sound like they're calling for anarchy, just playing hip hop, or playing whatever in the middle of the night and rolling with it. But yeah, they, they created an issue when it didn't need to be one created, I think. Yeah, it was, it just, yeah, just somebody probably just started paying a little more attention to it yeah. instead of just kind of letting it go its course. And, you know, just management style don't always have to be super duper hard. Sometimes you gotta kinda, well, you should be able to adapt it if it's, if it's working. And it was working, but it's just a lot of black people coming in after midnight. <laughs> Man, <laughs> don't get me started. I'm glad we're having this conversation because we there who is not enough time. Um, so, Doctor Spellers, what what is what is the direction you think of, or the role I should say, of alternative radio stations and how they look at music like house music or hip hop and and the programming of it? 
first, thank you so much for uh, moderating this panel and for having me here today. And thank you um, for joining us today, panelists. Um, to answer your question, I have to really reflect on how I really got started um, with radio. And it really started uh, in the basement. Um, I'm looking at the audience, and some of you all are particular age. Uh, so I know what you, you will know what I mean when I say the Kool-Aid house. Our house was the Kool-Aid house. Okay. Even though we didn't drink Kool-Aid, we drank lemonade. But our house was the Kool-Aid house. And my brother, John Spellers, John Randy Spellers, was the first person on our block, and I believe maybe in our neighborhood, who had techniques in the basement. And the only one with a custom uh, big, built uh, casket or case for the techniques. So when the word got out that there were some techniques in the South Shore in the neighborhood, Everybody came to our house. And that was okay with my parents because they were okay with us being the hangout house because they knew where we were. Um, and so uh, we had people, and I'm not gonna name drop, but just you know, before they were the famous DJs, they would stop at our house. Ferris been at our house DJing when he was a teenager and other people uh, would stop by. And for me, it was, um, you know, I could hardly get on the tables, right? Because all the guys were dominating the tables. And in my mind, I said, you know, when I have the opportunity, I am going to, I can do this and I could do it better, you know? And I couldn't do it better, but, you know, because there's a lot of great DJs out there. But that was my mindset. So when I think of college radio, I think of it as an opportunity to just try things out, um, to try different playlists, uh, to be creative, uh, to showcase different artists and as a um, radio DJ, to just get your feet wet. Um, our show um, was the Champagne and Brandy show. Had nothing to do with liquor. <laughs> uh, we were not, you know, uh, we were not heavy drinkers in school. Um, but Sa Sandra Roberts Vickery, who couldn't be here today, is the better half of our show. And um, I'm Brandy uh, on the show. And she had, has a beautiful, bubbly personality, just very witty. Uh, a smile that could light up the world. And um, we thought, well, she, she could be champagne. And I could be brandy, because I'm a little smooth, kind of laid back. And we kind of balanced each other, each other out. And so that's how the name came about. But for us, it really was just a learning ground um, to play different music. Um, I know we played some artists that had just come out who were just getting started um, in the house music field. And it was this opportunity for us to you know, be creative and share that. And I think that role should continue on the college level. And any of you can, can take this. What is the role of, uh, oh boy, Mario, take it easy. In my head, I'm doing a whole different show in my head, y'all. So forgive me what is our role as radio DJs in particular to our city what is our responsibility any of you can take it uh, I guess at this point for me um, thoughtful product just just very you know it ha it it should it should just it should be thoughtful. That's all. Sin just some sin some uh, sin sincerity behind it, and um, just good quality control. I'm not really trying to politicize everything. That's because that's it's enough. It's driving people nuts. Um, some good quality stuff. Break some you know good new music. Just. Whatever, whatever I can do to enhance the day and, and maybe get a chance to turn some people on to some new stuff, just responsible. What I would do now is nothing like what I would do in 1997. Right. And even 2007, it's-, it's <laughs> Or it's, 17. Or 1987, <laughs> it's, right. it's, it's, I've learned a lot and some stuff I wouldn't, you know, that I've done before to promote a show or played on a show, I couldn't play that stuff no more. And that's because that would be irresponsible on, on my, on my, on, on my part. And uh, yeah, just ultimately, just some real thoughtful product because I just feel there's a lot since the technology has allowed for the acquisition of the music to become easier. 
I feel like a, a lot of the pressure that normally would come with going out and acquiring cutting edge stuff, you lose the pressure and that and it it affects the quality of of, of everything that's going on right now. Mm. It's super easy to get the music. So it's like the challenge is to find the good stuff. Well, it's just it's made it, of, it you gotta cut through a lot of noise. Yeah. You gotta cut through a lot of noise. Yeah. So it um if you can take the easy route, a lot of people do. But it, it shows in it shows in the product. So just more thoughtfulness. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll chime in. I think, you know, for me it's important to keep radio relevant. I mean, again, there are so many mediums in which to obtain all kinds of information. And at one point, radio was it. You know, now there's so many things. So, you know, on-air radio, we think is I think is important, but it's also, I'm so excited about all the digital radio stations, and again, all of the different mediums that are bringing us content. I think it's important, you know, my show was the Vintage House Show, and I'm all about protecting black history, and created this show so as to protect black history and house music's black history. And I think we can use all of these mediums in a better way. Um, you know, I think I try to honor the past and allow that to inform the future. We have to use these mediums to make sure, again, that we're talking about the past and that we're also saying this past is critical to remember as you progress the music form and all black music forms. Yes, I just would echo and say again, like you had mentioned, be responsible. But then keep in mind, you know, who is your who is your audience? What story are you trying to share? What information are you trying to share to impact your audience? Um, Sandra's back on the radio. She just got back on the radio. She's on a show called. Um, I have my notes here, WFAV 95.1 FM, and her show is playing all the favorites in her community. Um, and so it may not be competing with, competing with some of the you know, bigger shows or bigger radio stations, but just knowing your audience and your impact. Um, I know as we reflected on this, Sandra and I the other day, we didn't realize the impact of our voice and our messages. You mentioned that you wouldn't do some of the things that you did before. Um, you know, we didn't realize when we would say, hey, come down to the studio and make a donation and show up, that people will actually show up, <laughs> you know, and be outside, you know, trying to get in and meet us. So those type of things, just make, making sure you're responsible and understanding that, you, that there is an impact that comes with, you know, being on the air. Real quick, I used to do a Thanksgiving show, like on Thanksgiving Day, and I would hear Herb Kent's voice in my head, and I'd be like, yo, you know, I'm down here. I haven't had any Thanksgiving dinner yet. If anybody wants to come down to university and bring a plate. And it only happened twice, but people would come, and it'd be, I'm like, damn, it works. And I'm like, Herb Kent's a genius. And I would just like to add to what they said. I, when I'm on the mic, and I, you know, for whatever reason, I'm still doing this radio show. I can't really answer why, besides I really like doing it. Um, but one of my heroes is sitting on my left, and I always hear first voice. I remember being able, and we'll talk more about it later, uh, being able to hang out with her and Rick Party at WGCI and how much I learned about authenticity and responsibility and thinking about those dudes and those women who used to be on the radio in Chicago and how not to mess it up because you never know who is listening to you not just listening to do something for you, but actually listening to what you're doing and, ta and saying in their head, I want to do that. And I don't ever want to be the guy to be like, well, I heard him say, <laughs> you know, there's no way in hell I'm going to listen to this show again. I want to make sure that when I open the mic, even if it's something that I think is controversial, I don't want to ever forget the responsibility as a black man first and as a man to be able to say, this is it from my point of view, this is how I feel about it. With that, I need to hear your point of view too. I think it's a give and take if you have that situation where you can do that with your audience and knowing your audience and not disrespecting your audience and all those things. But it would be authenticity <clears throat> and responsibility to anybody, Anybody, is particularly in Chicago, who has been on a microphone and had to do that because, as you all know, sitting on a mic and doing that two hours or four hours or sometimes six hours, depending on you and what your situation is, 
man, that's work. That's mental work because you're sitting there, you're like, okay, I got my breaks, I got the sheet, I got the songs, I got to say something cool, I'm going to take a call, I'm going to give away something. I'm, it's, a million, it's like it's chess and, and checkers all at once. But um, for me, that would be it. Let's get back to house music really quick. Um, some of us in the audience have been fortunate enough to have been to a Ron Hardy party. Uh, some of us have been fortunate enough to hang out with Frankie and be able to listen to him do his thing. And all the, the DJ Heather and, and it, oh, geez, Psycho and all of them that have spun at parties in Chicago. How much of the, what you heard at a party were you able to bring back to whether you were DJing a party or back to your show when you went to a house party? Because for me, house parties were the liberator. That's how you knew <laughs> who was who and what was what. There was no, you couldn't hide behind any nothing at a house party. Did you bring any of that back to your radio show, either back in the day or now? Sure. Well, for uh, Sandra and I, we would, and along with some other the DJs at WNUR, have to do um, guest appearances, <laughs> if believe it or not, at certain uh, clubs around the city. And one of them was CODs, because it was right up in Evanston. Um, and I think about it now, and it's so hilarious, um, these guest appearances. But we would go and um, listen to you know new music and artists that were sharing their music and try to bring some of that back. But the challenge, is, again, was um, some of the FCC regulations. We could only play a certain um, certain years of music. I don't know, I can't remember the, the, the legalese around it, but if it was recently released, there was some, uh, some uh, regulations around how long we could play it or um, if we could play it, um, things like that. So we, it was very st sort of structured in the early days um, that I recall of what we, what we could play. So that placed some limitations on it, um, but we would certainly try to shout out the people as much as we could. Um, on the show for you know the, the music they were releasing. So my sort of era was a little bit after hers, but I always sort of hearken back to T. Shabli, a guy named Sweet M. D. The I say that, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, and they were like powerhouse, like they were doing real things, which was a surprise, you know, to someone like myself, who my goal was not to be in radio. I just you know, heard Brandy and Champagne and some of my friends on the radio, and I was like, how come I'm not on the radio? And said, I need a, I need a show. Uh, but they were real artists, so they were at all the clubs, and they were, we, you know, we had our record pool at Imports, so we were getting all of the, the, our records from Imports, and Tisha Blee and all the other cats were getting things from who knows where, mm -hmm. and putting it on the thing, saying you know, they had their notes on the the top of the vinyl, they were like, it's good, you know, play track three, you know, things like that. And I was you know, a little younger and not as adventurous because I just, you know, I just was not, I'm gonna go to the warehouse, you know what I mean? I just wasn't gonna do it. I just felt like I wasn't able to go, I was short. I just didn't feel like they would let me in. So, but they would come in and say, this was hot, play it. And I, it was hot, I would play it, you know, but you know, we were also playing hip hop. I played house and hip hop on my show, and that's when I, Ice T was throwing out all these uncut, you know, things. And you could accidentally, you know, if you don't read everyone's notes properly, and if you don't play it yourself first, there's a couple of words in there in which could get you in real trouble. So I've had my show like stopped in the middle of it, and they're like, you know, you're off the air. I'm like, ooh, sorry about that. You know, like, so they would just cut you off. But we would all the time, you know, we would, again, the reason why I wanted to do an, a radio show as an adult that was interview style is because we had on, we brought into the studio Frankie Knuckles. Uh, Chrissy here, first lady, was on the show with The Eye. Um, we brought in people, I mean, Sweet MD would go to Jesse Saunders' house, pick him up, bring him on the station. So if they had anything new happening, we were trying to play it. We wanted to play it even if it wasn't on vinyl. We wanted to hear what they had to say. So we were absolutely bringing in everything from the clubs and then our DJs were playing in the clubs. So it worked out. So I didn't actually start, uh, I didn't get onto radio for the first time until 94, but um, really starting to pay attention to like, um, WHBK, CRX, NUR, in addition to like uh, B 
BMX, I guess B96. So that started like mid 80s. So yeah, I mean, I incorporate everything from everywhere. If it sounds good, even, you know, just as, as soon as I was able to remember remembering, that's how long I've been incorporating whatever. So it didn't matter where I got it from. If it sounded good, I was gonna find some way to add it in the mix. And that, I mean, that still goes for today. Real quick, yes or no for all of you. If you hear somebody playing something, like you could be anywhere, grocery store, somebody's house, passing somebody driving down the street and you hear a song you go I need to play that on my show has that happened to you like all the time I thought it was yes. I thought I yeah, okay yeah all the time all the time it's like what is this you know like sometimes I don't remember you know when I was a DJ I, I, what always impresses me about DJs is that in their head at every, probably at every moment moment they have a thousand songs in their head and when I was young I had 300 songs in my head, you know what I mean? <laughs> and now I'm like, I can't remember anything. You're like, what's that song? Who's the artist? Who's the artist? Because I want to play it or I want to just play it for myself or put it in the background or I want to find out who the artist is because I want to bring them on my show. So it's just, I hear anything and I'm losing it these days. Yeah. Like someone give me the information on this person. I find that I'm making my playlist for my songs every day. Every day, if you saw my phone, you'd be like, "Dude, that's kind of ridiculous. You should not have that. You you only are on the air for two hours. How do you have seventy five songs for one day?" But I'm always hearing stuff, and then I'm thinking about songs that I remember when I was young, and I'm thinking about songs at good parties I went to, those kind of things. So that was why I asked. I, I'm always curious to hear the person's um, process, especially when it comes to creating the playlist because we don't have a prepared playlist for us right if you're at a a situation a gci or a, or a v103 those lists are done for you and you're playing them and you're gonna make sure you hit that that if they still do a clock it's been so long <laughs> you're gonna make sure you hit every one of those the the one opportunity i had that went so far south it almost went past mexico south to uh, work at a radio station where they had the whole clock and the color chart, the pie chart and this, and you play that. When I first started, it was WHYZ in Greenville, South Carolina. And Whitney's super smash hit, I Will Always Love You, had just came out. This radio station was playing that song at the top of the hour, at 15 minutes after, at 40 minutes after, and at the top of the hour. If you didn't do it, peace. You can get back on a bus and go back to Chicago. So I, I learned to love Whitney Houston in a way that I can't explain. For, for at least two straight weeks, we played that song like that every day. And that, that I, I came to appreciate the power of being able to be trusted enough to create a playlist that wasn't tired. And I always try to make it something when I, because I, I got to listen to it. In fact, I'm not even really thinking about anybody else listening to it at that point, because I'm like, man, if I can't listen, if I got to listen to Whitney Houston 25 times in a day, I'm going to lose my mind. But if I can make something, because it's all art, right? If you can make something, create something that people will enjoy, I think that that is a, a wonderful thing. I do want to go to the archive stuff. Do you all have archive things? that my man Jody Presser is about to play on the screen. Uh, okay, so I'm, I brought a cassette tape <laughs> as a recording of uh, the Champagne and Brandy show. And just to give you some context, it is the third annual donation pledge drive at the radio station. Um, Champagne and I participated in the second annual drive and we raised, I think we had historically raised a, a lot of money that they hadn't raised before. And so they thought they would have us do it again. But this segment, she's not there. I'm trying to do it by myself. I'm trying to corral the guys outside. So there's other DJs um, on, on, on at the station. And so we're passing it from Studio A to Studio B to outside. Um, and it, we're going back to what you had mentioned earlier about being responsible, and I don't think today they would do this, but they had us call for people to come up to the station, like, come on up to, you know, WNUR, and we'll give you free um, bumper stickers and albums, whatever, if you make a pledge donation. And so, and if you came up, you also were invited to do a tour of the studio. It was only just me and a few people down there. 
it was not safe. It was not safe at all. And I think you hear me, if, if we're going to play it long enough, I'm not sure, but you may hear me say, oh, yeah, there's this guy, Wild Irish Rose, who came yeah. down to the studio. I don't know this guy at all. He just showed up <laughs> to the studio, and that, he told me that was his name. And so we had to call out their names if they gave a donation. So you're going to kind of hear the dynamic and the banter between myself and other people, minus uh, uh, VJ's not out here right now. Oh, hey, Rob. What? Why don't you tell them what this party is for? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, uh, do you know? Well, uh, just to have fun. That's of course, please do call us up and make your donations, 866-WNUR. And people are standing by to take your calls right in uh, the other studio. Uh, matter of fact, the phone just rang. We're going to get back into more good music. And of course, after me is VJ the G DJ coming up at 1 o'clock. But first, a few special hellos going out to Wild Irish Rose, who's going to party with me at COD tonight at 1201 West Devon. That's where it's located. Sweet MD is going to be spinning down there. And ladies, you get in free between 12 and 2. So why don't you hurry up and get down there? Um, we're having the party outside the studio at 1205 Sheridan Road and if you get lost just ask for Annie Mae Swift and sell it Doc it. sell it isn't that right folks right, right. <laughs> and remember it's not like that it's like this there you go that's right that's how you do it that's how you do it sell it that's awesome Let's give her a nice round of applause. That's how you do it. Told that man you were going with him, the CODs. You ain't know him from a can of paint. He like, ooh, Make my lucky day. <laughs> hey, give me that money, Wild Irish Rose. I'll go. Sure, I'll go. Wait, yeah, that was like 1985, 86, I think. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, J2, your turn. Uh, I mean, oh, here we go. Oh, it's kind of dark. Okay, that's me. Uh, that is 1994. <laughs> um, at, this was my first, my first run on the radio ever at uh, WBML, where Black Music Lives, Ooh. University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Almost exactly 30 years ago. Get your oh, mic. Oh, my bad. Look. Okay. Yeah. Yep, 1994. Uh, first time on the radio, WBML, where black music lives. So it was something weird that was going on. Like they were doing something. They were trying to figure out a way to like uh, pipe the music directly into university property or something. So it was, it was a weird time for the radio when I got on. Um, it was, it wasn't a like, I wasn't able to format my own show. I was brand new. I, you know, I went in there, I uh, learned the ropes. I think they, my shows were on Sundays. Um, and yeah, it looks like you can see the carts back there behind oh, yes. me. So <laughs> that'll let you know what was going on. And uh, yeah, it was just, I mean, to be honest, the show was pretty, it was pretty huff. It was. It I was just I was just there to learn, just because that's I figured out. Look, if I'm gonna be on the radio, I'm just gonna have to learn the basics. I'm gonna have to do what they want me to do initially. Right. So I went in there and I, you know, I did my thing and um, yeah, that was it. Where black music lives. Ha. Okay. So this this is quite interesting. 1999. All right, so there's a couple of things happening here. <laughs> <laughs> to say the there's, least. There's a, lot of, there's a lot happening. The picture itself is from School of the Art Institute. So this was actually a very dear friend of mine named uh, A. Damani Harris. Peace, Damani. Yeah, Best so he was brother. my roommate in college. Um, he used to produce, we would put on plays. So I would, do, I would do live scoring 
right. for, for stage productions on turntables. So we did that down at U of I between 93 and 95. But this is like some in the late 90s down at the Art Institute, part of his master's uh, thesis. So, um, and then there's just some dates on there from when I was out playing all around. You get a uh, drink with Blase Blah? So, Blah, I don't know if, so Blase Blah was actually a guy from San Diego. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a wild night. The Culture Club. Boy. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, that, yeah, that was. I never got that free buffet. Did you ever see the food at that there, ever? There, there was no free I buffet. I never saw food. They would always there, advertise free buffet, but I never saw food. There was no free uh, buffet. Right. But this had to be around 95, because that would have uh, been around the time I came back to Chicago. And um, the guy, Blase Blah, he's from San Diego. Met up with some other uh, buddies of mine at Hampton. Uh, came, moved back to Chicago, and then it turned into a really interesting period in time because it was some it was some people who would go on to be some major major players, kind of involved in all of this. But uh, yeah, we was just out here, man, trying to you know catch it wherever we could, you know, riding on buses with crates and man. doing whatever we had to do to go rock. So. Yeah. Still That's upset it. about that free buffet. Never saw any food exist. ever. That was wild. Okay, Lauren. So I mentioned this before. I created an exhibit uh, honoring the history of house music. And in doing that, I also um, researched the history of house music at WNUR. And one of the first artifacts I found in the archive uh, very hidden. Black history is not all that relevant at Northwestern, which is, I'll tell you another story about me making Northwestern hire an archivist to uh, celebrate and preserve the history of, of black people at Northwestern. Um, but this is a Thank you. an artifact that was since fall 1993. In 1983, I apologize. I ended up talking to both of the people who are mentioned there, Catherine Kerr and another guy who's on that thing. It's hard to read, but it basically says that Miss Kerr, uh, in deciding to, uh, I guess at one point she was the, the street beat producer and became the general manager of the station. In doing that, I guess before she left or the other guy left, they decided um, and they have their explanation there that they were going to change the name of the Soul Show to the Street Beat Show. And, you know, again, I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't know why you had to, I guess you could only have one black show, like it could have been a Soul Show and it couldn't have been a Street Beat Show. Uh, you can see the playlist there. So it went from a lot of, it went from what was sort of becoming sort of a hip hop, you know, sort of, and, and house music thing, sort of moving from sort of R&B, funk, you know, some of those other music genres, soul, to then what was becoming street beat, which is why they decided to do it. But the thing that was just interesting to me is that, you know, I feel like black music is always policed. Um, there were white people, I mean, in case you have to believe we're at Northwestern University, it's a bunch of white people, right? So it's like, I can't imagine that, uh, you know, they're not trying to police it, but, there were two white people controlling what was happening on that black music show. And, you know, and it didn't stop, actually. Um, you know, white people like black music. I mean, that's what's up. But you would think that there are so many black people, well, so many is probably an overstatement, but there were black people there who could have been overseeing those shows. If you do further research, what you find is that there were black people doing the soul show and the shows before that, but they would have altercations with the powers that be at Northwestern and at WNUR, and they were expelled from Northwestern and expelled from the show, which means then the Europeans took over the leading those shows. And then you had Catherine Kerr and this other guy, uh, Steve Hobbs, I believe, um, running what was the Street Beat show. 
uh, that was, you know, that was sort of, again, they were running the soul show. So when you look back, you, you know, you, where were the black people in this show? And they were all, you know, sort of easily removed. But luckily, some people did complain, and they were, um, you can see it in, w, uh, in the Northwestern Archives history. Their newspaper did document that our black student organizations were always protecting the black DJ is there because they were always in some kind of altercation with management. But this was just, this is a relevant document that says, and Street Beat is still going on. It celebrated 40 years in 2023. So, nice. um, yeah, nice. it was still on there. That's why my show was on the Street Beat show. <laughs> you know, so, nice. uh, and so I'm happy about that. But this is just the impetus of that. And it's just, it, it says a lot in that. And that, those three paragraphs say a lot about what goes on at Northwestern, who makes the call there. But it also says a little bit about black music, what was going on in black music, and how it was transitioning from the funk to the soul to house music and hip hop. Um, Joe, do you have that picture of me and the man that tried to kill me? It's a little blurry, but I, I do want to give some context to the picture because it's one of my favorite pictures and it's important to me uh, for a lot of different reasons. But um, the day that we did the Battle of the Best, I got nervous toward the end that it wasn't going to be a document of it besides him beating us and cheating because that's what he did. And anybody that knows, if you beat Herb Kent, you never got a chance to do it again because he would remind you this will never happen again just like he told me when when he beat us um and okay but anyway it's a picture of me and her and i (laughs) we became friends after i had a chance to be on the battle he um he was really good to me about talking to me about things that had nothing to do with radio i think for me the value of our friendship as brief as it was, was that part. I got to talk to him about stuff. Stuff that I needed too, and I didn't realize that I needed it. But he was very, very good about that. I know how he was with, with folks like First and with other people. He was he was generally the dude that you sought out, right? And and was like, hey, look, I need your advice about something. Like, I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about this hat I have on. He told me one time, I was standing on 53rd Street, he goes, Mario. I'm like, wow. You know, that's already, it's her Kent. He pulls up. <laughs> this is when Benny's was right there on 53rd, across from what is now the promontory and all that stuff. He goes, hey, man, keep an eye on my car. And he like, throws, like I'm a valet. <laughs> I'm like, her, I'm not about to watch your car. Yeah, you will. And he goes in Benny's. He came out. You're still here, huh? I'm like, I couldn't just leave you with your keys, Herb. That dude, man, he was he was wild. That was a wild man. That was a wild man. Um, as we yes, I'm, sure. I know you're waiting for your photo to come up, but I wanted to sort of follow up with what Lauren was saying about Northwestern and the history and some of the politics. And I definitely can speak to an experience of that on our show, um, the Champagne and Brandy show. Again, we were freshmen, um, and named after our show because of our personalities. But there was. Um, an allegation made towards us that we were drinking in the studio Uh, one time, which we never did. We never did. And if you can imagine, um, (laughs) you know, we're freshmen. We are wanting to maintain a great grade point average. I was just wrapping up an internship at Oprah Winfrey show my freshman year. Sandra was um, um, about to join a service organization that I also joined later, but she was also a, a cheerleader on the football team. So we had really busy schedules. Um, and so when this person made that allegation, um, it was toward the end of the semester, right finals, right at finals mm. time. So there's no cell phones, there's no c- computers the way we know now. So how are we going to get the word out to the Northwestern community that this allegation has been made against us when we're trying to pull our nighters to study for finals? We don't have time to deal with this. Um, So we went to the advisor at that time, I won't name the person's name, Um, and we said we're going to file an appeal against this because we did not do this in the allegation, and it came down to this person's word against ours. They had no proof, no proof at all. I think we might have been suspended for a couple of shows, um, and we had to write letters to make sure we got our show back. 
Um, and it w- was all because they wanted our time slot. That's what I think wow. it came down to. I'm going to allege that. I'm going to, I don't want to get sued. So I'm going <laughs> to allege that they wanted our time slot. We were Saturday nights from 10 to 1. That was the ideal time slot to have for 89.3. Everybody listened to your show before they went out. And right? everybody was listening to it when they were on their way back. Probably. Yeah. So, so again, that sort of speaks to that struggle. But a full circle moment happened for me uh, because I went on to get my Ph.D., um, and teach on the college level. And the person who was the faculty advisor at that time ended up being my colleague at this other university. So I was able to you know, use that as a learning uh, you know, opportunity, a lesson, to be a better faculty member to my students, right, and be more supportive of my students, listen to both sides of the story uh, you know, when it came to any issues that came in front of me as a faculty member, but also to go back to that person who now was my colleague uh, these many, many years later and, and revisit that. Yeah. Um, you know, with a real brief conversation, but we we we, did, we had a chance to revisit that because, in my head, they did not follow protocol. You know, now as an adult, I can think back and say, wait a second, there was really no protocol followed. Um, if you did, there should have been more. It should have been more amplified because there was no proof on your side to suspend us for our show. Um, the other thing with college radio in terms of safety and how things might have changed is, you know, our station was in the middle of campus. It's so dark to get there in the middle of campus. And so two females on the radio having to walk home after that um, was scary, you know? And campus police could only take you to the edge of campus. So if you lived off campus, you had to walk on your own the rest of the way. There was no Uber, right? There was no Uber. (laughs) So those are just some of the challenges, but again, opportunities. Because I went on, you know, Sandra's back in radio. Um, I didn't stay in radio, but I went from there to intern at like places like Leo Burnett the Chicago Cultural Center. I use Chicago as my playground, and I always tell my students, you know, who are interested in radio or being creative, use this as your playground. College is the best time to use all their resources for free. If you, you know, what you're paying tuition for, you're paying for it. So use all those resources. Try the radio. Try any other thing you want to try at the college level. This is the time to do it, and this could be an opportunity, a stepping stone to learn something and to fail at it <laughs> or to perfect it and a safe environment. I won't even go into getting suspended and in trouble at WHBK that or or any of the goings on that happened in that. Uh, yeah, no, we won't have that conversation today. You haven't lived either until you've taken a cart and thrown it across the room because it was broke. Have you ever done that, Jay? Oh, I was. I was. They were like little frisbees. I would toss them bad boys. Like this is broke. Every rip. Um, I'd like to take some questions from our audience. Audience, you have questions? Here's your, look at everybody like, questions? Yes, questions. That's part of the deal. That's why we're here. If you have any questions for our panelists uh, or me, I, I'm more than happy to answer them. Please don't all rush at once. Well, I don't have a question, but I have more of a, something that I wanted to add to what you all are talking about with the college radio um, part. Um, nobody, you know, we didn't, you didn't really talk about WKKC, and I understand that's because no one here really represents that air, area. Um, but WKKC was very instrumental in um, house music as well as hip hop, with the rap down, with uh, I mean, with a uh, rap house with Pink House, one, two, one, two. who who rests in peace, who really um, was on the cutting edge of hip hop artists. I mean, when you got Chuck D speaking at your funeral, the, you know. When you, when you got the LL Cool J, you know, sending you flowers, you really did make an impact to help put Chicago on the map on the mainstream where record labels were really um, uh, recognizing who you were. That's a really big deal. Um, and that's not to take anything away from uh, what J.P. Chill did or what was what was happening. Or what was happening at... Um, or what was happening at um, WNUR. But it's to say that there is, this is such a great thing because it's such a large, um, Chicago's such a large market. And now you got WCSU doing, um, yeah, WCSU, yeah, doing, doing, doing their thing. Mm-hmm. But so you had Pink House, uh, you had the Friday Night Audio mm-hmm. um, with, with uh, Hugo H., H. Walter Get Down Brown, yeah. um, 
Yeah, Bobby, Bobby Pico. Pico. So you have these people that were, you had Street Beat, but Friday Night Audio preceded, was before Street Beat. And they, they really were um, what Lee Michaels looked at when he said, hey, these college kids over here are killing us on a Friday night, what's going on? So, which, then, you, then we ended up with the Hot Mix Five. Now, of course, you know, you had other folks uh, DJing, but not in the way that these black guys were doing it with house music and disco. And when you talked about going to hear, um, going to clubs and hearing uh, records and then going back to the radio station and playing it, and I'm speaking for him and he's sitting in the room, but Hugo H. would hear stuff or there would be stuff that we'd be playing at the power plant, if I'm not mistaken, power plant, and he would take it back and introduce it. So this is how um, those of us who were short and thought we couldn't get in, this is how we uh, came to find out all about that music and what was happening in that scene. So I just wanted to make sure that, I, that uh, WKKC was included and the hard work that they continue to do to, uh, to give a voice to, to music that commercial radio would never look at, and we can talk about that a little later on. And I will absolutely piggyback on that by saying you probably listened to KKC first to find out what was hot and what was happening in any of those genres of music. Exactly what you just said, Chrissy. I did not mean to leave them out. I absolutely apologize for that. There is really, and I, I can say this because of Pink House, the idea of somebody like me being able to be on a radio station anywhere was not even a thought. I happened to hear Isidore Pink do his business, and I was like, I can do that. I might not do it better than him, but I know I can do it. And uh, all those years with Mr. Rick Party in broadcasting school, <laughs> we would talk about Pink House a lot. Not to mention his name is Pink House. It, it, that, right, part. Pink House. House that part. Pink House. That part. That part. Yeah, he was he was he was a monster in this world, and he did such a wonderful job at KKC, man. So and then we, moved on and did so many other things. Yeah. On top of that, but I w I'm just going to highlight that I did a, a quick article for the Tribe T R I I B yes. dot com Absolutely. on the history of the radio stations, college radio stations, and their importance in the city of Chicago and globally. Because again, some of these, p thank you so much, Abra, but it, I want you all to please check it out because it highlights HBK, KKC, WNUR, Pink House, how he went from KKC to do better things. Like it, sh it shows their impact, the college radio's impact across the world. And, and very seriously, programmers listened or at least back then they did, to what was happening on college radio stations because they could not figure out to save their life while on Fridays and Saturday nights they were getting walked regularly, like not even a little bit, like frighteningly so. And they were like, well, we need to start hiring these people that are doing these college shows. Because you have, you have NUR uh, on the up north. Mm -hmm. so, they, so they took those up north listeners. Then you had HPK that took the middle of the city. And then you had KKC yeah. that took everything else. And so that left very little for BMX and GC. <coughs> Very little. And B96 wasn't even, that wasn't nobody even cared that they existed. Okay, we're going to get some questions. He's got to have his hand up over here. But I want to say quickly that this was supposed to have been happening at KKC. That's where our choice, first choice of place to host this event. Um, you know, just a lot of the application, the process, because I wanted to do it there in honor of yeah. Pink House. And we also reached out to folks from, um, um, CRX as well. Um, I know we had some things going on at the um, on the west side with Triton College radio station. So I was thinking of all of you guys, you know, to putting this together. But we are blessed and lucky. That's why we follow you when you tell us to show up to places. <laughs> so we're going to take this question. I actually just want to mention that we um, that we thought Lamont Watts might show up this afternoon from uh, KKC, um, so that we are working on getting him here in a little bit. You know, we always gonna do more. You know, so it's, it's, we sure. got, this, this is not gonna stop. Okay. Thank you. All right. Real quick question. Um, as people that have been on the radio stations and from house music slash hip hop, 
during the time uh, house music was just flourishing and hip hop was just starting and we're talking about the rap part of it where Eazy came out and started doing the F the Police and all that other stuff. Did you guys find it harder to get your music or did, did you find your music being scrutinized more versus before that? For me, it wasn't because NWA was smart and they made radio edits of every song that they did. So, and, and, I, and again, watching, I, I wanted to save this for when she and I were talking, watching what First Lady used to do and how she would be very, like, <laughs> I'm trying, it was one specific thing that you used to do, Chrissy, I can't remember it now, but it was how you framed each song, right? You, you didn't, it was like, okay, I'm gonna listen. And, and I think the, the idea when it's songs like that that are controversial or songs that are, you know, that may be a little bit out of the, the norm, if you've had a chance to digest them and analyze them for yourself, it's easier to, to present it. It's not like, hey, here's a song that got 50 people killed. Listen to it, because that's dangerous. You don't want to do that. But if it's that same song and it has a story or a message behind it that has something very important and tangible to it, and you as a human being are able to analyze and listen to it and go, I think this means I can, I can say this and people will listen to it and not be afraid of it. And real quick, Public Enemy, when they first came out, they had a concert, and that concert uh, resulted in a stampede. Uh, where some folks got killed. And it was a part, it was in that part of their career where they didn't know if Yo Bum Rush the Show was gonna be the last album they made. But the music on it was powerful enough that it, it transcended the poor planning of this music venue where these people were hurt. And the DJs that played Public Enemy knew it and they were able to sell the music and not sell the tragedy. So I think a lot of it is just, are you, are you are you selling tragedy and pain or are you selling art? Are you, are you promoting tragedy and pain or are you promoting art? Um, I, I've been listening to you guys talk about all these different radio stations. I'm a avid, born and raised on the West Side and one of the stations I didn't hear was CYC. It was hard for me to get, it was hard for me to get CRX. HPK from the west side so my go-to was WCRX Pablo Punk Out Gonzalez um, and I heard y'all talk about how um, Herb Kent would turn around and play punk music or whatever I used to get my punk music from him um, but it's interesting that this is coming full circle now and I actually like this idea because I've been talking to people on the west side Kevin McSwain um, and Larry Hurd and him are very good friends of mine um, there were places in the late 80s, early 90s. I don't know if you guys heard of Foxes and Hounds. Yeah, so I worked in Foxes and Hounds with Nature Love and Tago. Um, I know Tago's one of your good friends. Uh, so I appreciate this kind of dialogue, and I'm hoping you guys keep this going because um, we do need to pull. There, every area of the city has some house music history. What, no matter how minute it is. And then as we get a little older, we kind of forget some of this stuff, but then when this one person come up and they'll pull out, oh yeah, like you pulled out this flyer early and I was like, oh, I forgot about Culture Club. <laughs> and the $4, the $4 entry. We, when did we ever have, how long ago was $4 entry? <laughs> the rule. Five bucks to get in there and good luck. So at the end of this, I just wanted to say I appreciate all of this. Can I, can I ask, can I hear from everybody on that question? Because that was one of my questions, actually. Um, how difficult did you find it to maintain your format or your playlist when um, the content of more popular music started to change? I mean, NWA is like one example, but there are several, like the Puff Daddies and the Staten Third from like late night. There was a public service announcement, Danger Mouse and Jay-Z, on the album that nobody was supposed to play on the radio, and I was playing it on HPK, and I had to edit it myself. I was, yeah, for sure. 
I was determined to play that song, so I would edit it. And and if it came down to it, I would do that so people could hear the music, so my playlist would stay intact. And I'm going to be brief because I, I shared a little bit about it earlier, but I can definitely appreciate your question. I think, again, one of the constraints that we had on our show at that time, and it may have changed later, was, again, some FCC guidelines that we had to follow um, and uh, were asked not to play certain songs on our playlists. Um, that again, and it was, they even, I just recall, and again, I, my memory's you know, a little dated, but um, the certain songs had, it, it was a certain year, I don't know if it's like a five year window, 10 year window, we had to stay within a certain window of when the song came out. Um, and I don't know if that was because they want to compete with their major radio stations at the time and for their listeners, but we were definitely um, getting our hands slapped a little bit about what we were playing. I got a question for you about that, Renee. Was that something that you all were told, or was this a rule that was posted in the studio? That was something we were told. Because it and only applied to, to the black shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we had the ability to take out all the other shows with listenership. So that is why um, they did that to, to you guys. And, and I, I can say that for sure from being at Columbia, uh, at, at CRX. There were certain things that they would tell us. They know pass you the mic so they, you can get that on. Oh, I'm sorry. To say it. I can, I'm sorry. That's okay. Okay, so my question again was, was that something that they just told you all or was it actually posted as a rule in the studio? I, I can't remember, but I think it was something they just told us, that yeah. they told us. Generally, yeah. it, 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 it was because look at all the music that you could choose from and look at where you could go with it, black, whether it's black music, soul music, music that was influenced by black folks. So they wanted to keep you in in just a box so you couldn't blow all the other shows out the water. And I don't doubt that, you know, and again, it comes down to, you know, mentorship, mentorship. And if you didn't have the mentors in place who wanted to see you succeed, you know, you're gonna get different yeah. messages. Oh, yeah. um, luckily I did, we did have a few people there, Sweet MD, I were other people who paved the way and one or two professors who would, you know, encourage us. Yeah. But again, we were doing it, we were winging it and just doing it on our own. But you, you figured out a way to do it. We figured out a way. Yep. Uh, generally, for college radio, it's um, if the if the station is paying royalties for the song to play, you can play whatever. Um, if you um, and the song needs to be available for purchase, that's that. Those are like what the FCC would say, you know. But they made up all kind of rules for us to keep us pushed to the back. And we, we didn't question it. Well, if you recall, you know, hip hop was becoming very dangerous for everybody. Um, they were taking people to jail, as they're trying to do today, for their lyrics. Uh, just for anything that they did, they immediately suggested that they were, Snoop Dogg was on trial, he was gonna go to jail for something that he may or may not have done, but because of his lyrics, and because, of course, that's when they started putting all of the labels on the, on the albums as well. Um, so we were in constant scrutiny, and someone like me, who, you know, was did not was not trying to be a, a DJ for the rest of my life. I didn't take the FCC certification, <laughs> so I just was like, I don't know what the rules are. I can't say this at, to ten o'clock. I can't do this. I just put anything on that I thought was cool. And of course, you don't always listen to, as I said earlier, to the entire song to realize that some words are in there that probably shouldn't happen. And you don't think. Our shows were from 10 o'clock until 1 o'clock, and at one point from 10 o'clock until 2 o'clock as time went on, and then for four hours. You don't think anyone's like particularly listening to your thing, so I probably got away with it a thousand times. And then one time, of course, at 1 o'clock in the morning, they were like, you're off the air, <laughs> leave the station. And I was like, uh-oh, <laughs> like, that sucks. You hope that no one, but it was summertime too, and then no one, I got went right back the next week and no one said a word, you know, that kind of thing. But, you know, someone might have been here. So we're, there was constant scrutiny because black music is always constantly scrutinized. Okay, so my first, so I realized that me starting in 94 has definitely got to be a much different time for y'all operating in the 80s because I know it was a lot more strict, a, a much more strict. By the time I got on in 94, it wasn't an issue because they, they had the rotation sheet 
and they pretty much had everything that I was going to play already there. I would bring in a few records, but I knew what the deal was. They, you know, they told me, you know, you, they didn't even have to tell me. It's the middle of the day, no profanity. Um, and they, they pretty much had it all laid out for me. So it wasn't an issue then. Uh, the show I did after that was a uh, old, oldie, old rare groove, dusty show. Not a, really an issue there. And then by the time I'm playing music that it's like that, it was a rap show. So it's after 10 o'clock, you, you, you get a PSA and you can play whatever you want. So it, it just wasn't really, it wasn't really a huge deal at that point. But Safe you know. Harbor hours. So, yeah, but even still, I'd be hard pressed to necessarily do that slot now. Cause I just, some of it ain't just ain't for me no more, so. I have a, a, a tech question. Um, technology has advanced leaps and bounds. It has allowed for new sounds to be created. Um, people are dipping their toes into house music like never before. What does, what do you think the future looks like when it comes to new technology, AI, and house music? What does that future look like to you? And do you think it would be, <laughs> we have our purists, we all know. H how do you feel about it, basically? I think it's all gonna sound like it used to sound. I think it's all gonna be sing-alongs. If, it, if if AI has anything to say about it, it'll sound as truest to the form of the purists as it can sound. And I think you're going to hear a lot of what you, I, I think, I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to be a lot of sing-alongs and a lot of everything's going to sound like it used to sound and won't be a lot of creativity in it. Fortunately. I feel a little different. I, I do believe that musicians and those who and all of us will start to really scrutinize music a little bit more. I think we're gonna be able to understand what was digitally created and what was birthed from a guitar or a horn or something. I, I believe that we're gonna start to really become sort of music you know, purists and specialists ourselves. We know if someone's mimicking something else. I think it's gonna be difficult and these technologies will continue to improve, but I think even there's going to be something on these on these mediums that said this is digitally you know curated and i believe that someone eventually is going to start tagging these things to say this was not made by a human you know whatever so i think that there's uh, technology continues to increase but we will too we, we're going to get smarter as well he's sipping his word i <laughs> oh boy this is a great question um you know i'm all for innovation and creativity and I was just having this conversation with my husband a couple of weeks ago. My son plays the cello, and sort of hearkening to what you were saying, Lauren, I was telling him, because he doesn't like to practice all the time, and I said, stick with it, son, because there's going to be a niche for live music and live musicians. There's going to be a demand for that in the future, because pe that's going to become a lost art. And so I do think that, that we're going to go back to that. We're going to be able to hopefully distinguish um, between the two, but I'm excited for what the future holds because I think, again, we're so we're so creative, we're so innovative as a people that um, you know we c we are constantly creating and developing and coming out with new things, and I'm just can't wait to see um, what the future holds. Um, I have to think about this carefully. I think with. First of all, I, I I love to avail myself to technology. If something, if there's something that I feel like that can help me out, I'm down to try it. Um, I am a fan of the old ways. Um, I think it will be a clearer divide between the the kind of human generated sounds versus machine or electronically generated sounds. I mean, we're kind of in a weird space where most of the stuff we hear is electronically generated. Um, and that's it just kind of, it's gonna force part of the underground more underground. And usually it's not a bad thing in regards to, you know, like 
artistic innovation and, and whatnot, but me personally, I'm not into the idea of artificial intelligence. Um, I understand it's not going anywhere. I know it's in my pocket, so it's not like I'm totally against it. It's just in terms of I don't need as long as my brain is working, I'm gonna try and I'm gonna try and max out. So I'm not I'm I'm not necessarily willing to give up that part of the creative process to AI, maybe for business or something else or for writing, but in general, nah, I like I, I want my brain to sweat a little bit so i i enjoy that part i enjoy that part of the process it's it's the truth so there it is i want to thank you all for being here today and and spending some of your saturday with us um it is important that we archive everything document all of it and and uh the journey that you all have been on is very important and, and vital to the success of what we are all trying to do here in our city and in our different, uh, in our medium with different musics and things like that. So J2, Lauren, Dr. Speller, Sims, thank you all for being here today.